everyone, and welcome to this episode of She Got Next with me, Pepper Persley. I've got a special episode for you today. I put together a panel of Erica Ayala, Natalie Hevron, and Jackie Powell, and we discussed this WNBA season. Hope you enjoy the discussion. So I'm very excited for um, this panel today. Um, and yeah, if there's anything that you guys have questions about, um, feel free to ask. And then we, if everybody's okay, we can get right on into the discussion. Ready to go, following your lead. Yeah, okay. same here, all ready okay. to go. So I have seven questions and I hope I can get everybody's answers to all of these. Um, who do you think should be MVP of the 2020 WNBA season? We can start with Jackie. No. Ah, um, okay. So I've always put the edge towards Asia Wilson because I've found that without looking at the stats and getting all hung up in, you know, player impact estimates or things of that nature, Asia Wilson's game pretty much has permeated to the identity of her team. And so I think if you were to take Asia Wilson out of the aces, their entire identity would collapse because where they are successful, she is successful. So I guess that's a short way to put it, but that's what I've always thought. Well, that's a really good answer. Uh, go ahead to Erica. Yeah, I think for me, the, the MVP race is, is really coming down to Stewie. Um, you know, Brianna Stewart and Asia Wilson. Similarly to Jackie, uh, right now I'm giving the edge to Asia, Asia Wilson. And I think it is, uh, again, very much in, in the vein of what Jackie said, that um, when Asia Wilson was drafted to the Las Vegas Aces, it was made evidently clear that this was her team. And so to hear Jackie say, uh, the aces go as Asia goes. Well, that was always the plan. I think Stewie has had some of that. However, she has a fail safe and always has had a fail safe. And that, of course, is Sue Bird. And Asia Wilson hasn't necessarily had that. Um, and so I think for me, looking at these two teams, jockeying for that number one spot, Las Vegas without some elements and some pieces that really could make a huge impact, I, I give the edge to Asia Wilson. Yeah. What are your thoughts, Natalie? Um, so I kind of have two answers, who I think should be MVP and then who I think will be. Um, the shorter answer is I think Brianna Stewart is going to win MVP um, just because of the number she's put up, especially coming off of that Achilles injury. Um, and I do have a little bit of Brianna Stewart bias being a UConn fan, um, so I do acknowledge that. But just – the number she's put up and how successful the team has been, I think that's kind of where it's going to lie. However, I do really agree that Asia Wilson is also deserving. Um, but this is what I talked about in our piece, our roundtable piece, um, was Alyssa Thomas. Um, her nickname's The Engine. The Connecticut Sun run on her. Um, the offense just didn't really run the way it was supposed to in the game. She didn't play in last week with a hand injury. Um, so even just statistics aside, she um, contributes in every facet, offense, defense. So just to have that versatility outside um, and not playing um, was really evident how valuable she really is to the team. I think those are all really great points. Um, I'm going to have to agree with Natalie going with Stewie. Um, also, my preseason pick, so I have to stick with it for that. But um, just first of all, her team is at the top of the standings right now, which um, the Aces are at number two, but being at the top says a lot about her skill. And, of course, coming off of the Achilles in injury, one of the worst injuries that you can have as a basketball player, and coming back and being in the MVP conversation, let alone having a lot of people thinking that she should win, um, is really, really impressive. Okay. Um, and who do you all think should be Defensive Player of the Year? Starting with Jackie, then Erica, then we can go to Natalie. 
So this one, I feel like there's a little bit more conversation that we may have about this one, because again, you can look at the numbers and you can look at the story they're telling, and then you can look at what you see on the court and how maybe a team's identity has changed because of X player being a part of that team. So I guess when you think about the numbers, when I went to the stats and I looked up um, defensive win shares, I did see Alicia Clark, which I was like, okay, that makes sense because Alicia Clark has always been solid on defense. Um, the Seattle Storm are very solid on defense. But without looking at the stats, I have always been attached to Brittany Sykes because I just think what she's added to the Sparks I mean, she's literally given them a spark in the amount of steals that she generates each game and her defensive intensity. We just, the Sparks weren't known in 2019 to be a defensive team. And, and I understand Candace Parker is playing at a certain level defensively as well. But I mean, she was on the 2019 team and I also understand she wasn't at her full health. But the fact that when you add Brittany Sykes and when she accumulates the minutes that she has, and then L.A. becomes this more defensive dynamo, you have to question. You have to think, well, how did that happen? Um, so my pick is Brittany Sykes. I know that's not a popular one, but I just, when I saw her for the first time this season, I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good, solid pick. I think as as much as defense can be entertaining, Sykes definitely brings defense to that level. Um, I think, though, as someone who in all sports that I cover is really a purist when it comes to defense, I do think that unfortunately this award is tough because the best defender is the one that you're not talking about, usually. Um, because they're doing everything that they need to do to get the ball into the hands of their offensive players and, and to, to control the pace of a game. Um, so with that, I did look at the stats more than I usually do, and I don't think that you can really give this award to anyone that's not on the Seattle Storm, uh, because if you think of defense, again, as, as much as it is of stops, it's also controlling the pace and having the ball in your hands as much as possible. So, so with that, I'm going with Clark. Um, I'm going with AC. I think um, another player, though, and Natalie, I'm curious what you might say about this, is AT, uh, Alyssa mm -hmm. Thomas, just because I think both uh, Clark and Thomas are expected to and do, are, defend very well at positions literally one through five. And that, to me, really stands out as someone who is deserving of Defensive Player of the Year. Yeah, uh, the Suns head coach, um, Kurt Miller, was just actually talking about how AT can guard one to five. Um, and that's actually who I was going to mention because I haven't really heard her name come up, but she leads the leagues in steals, is one of the top rebounders, despite being shorter than a lot of other really talented rebounders. Um, she's only 6'2", but the way she's built, um, I kind of joke that she's built like a brick wall. Uh, there was the gift that kind of went viral at the beginning of uh, the season where Lexi Brown ran into her and was like um, laying flat on the floor. But just her versatility on the defense, guarding everyone, even if it's not a play that comes up on the stat sheet, she's involved, she's crashing the board, she's doing everything um, that somebody like four or five inches taller than her does. Um, and then she's using that defense to also fuel her offense. Um, so just having all of that that she can do really impresses me on the defensive end. Um, and I might be a little biased because the Sun are obviously the team that I watch the most, um, especially in this condensed season. It's kind of hard to watch teams consistently that aren't your own, whether it's because of availabilities that kind of overlap or um, you're writing, so you're not paying attention. Um, so there is that, but she's just everywhere all the time. Um, and she plays a lot of minutes, which has made this also really impressive because 
after and there, she looked at tired maybe a couple times in the the early games where maybe it didn't translate on the offensive end, but her defense was still stellar even when her offense wasn't. Um, so she hasn't really gotten tired playing. I think she's still top five in the league in minutes per game. So that's also something that's really impressive about her defensive skills. Well, I think Brittany Sykes and Alyssa Thomas are some great picks, but um, I'm going to have to go with AC. Um, just because she brings the intensity and the passion and she just loves it so much, like um, – she, you just see her being so passionate about defense and, and loving that and getting a stop and like getting so excited and, and hyped up because of that. And I feel like that I, um, I didn't look at the stats as much, but when I'm watching her, that's what I see. Um, and I'm also kind of biased to biracial angels in the WNBA. So um, I went for her also because of that. Um, but, and now I'm going to take rookie of the year pick, starting with Jackie, um, to Erica and Natalie. Oof. You know, I have to say, listening to Natalie talk about Alyssa Thomas, I'm sort of sold. Just hearing about how much she does and the weight that she has to carry. I mean, if you think about when we were talking about MVP, we are like, yeah, you know, Stewie has a lot more help. AC has a lot more help, too. But then again, I don't know, is that really valued in Defensive Player of the Year? But anyway, I digress. Um, Rookie of the Year, I mean, this has been a one-person race with Dangerfield. I mean, the the person who I think is going to win and who deserves it is Dangerfield. There is no one doing what she is doing from her rookie class. Um, The fact that on multiple nights she's either been the top scorer or the second – or in second place for scoring on her team. You know, it's not just a fluke. It didn't just happen once or twice. It happens consistently. And I mean, it's not, she's playing for Cheryl Reeve, who I've heard doesn't like to start rookies. So (laughs) Crystal, (laughs) she made quite an impression. I will say though, I did watch a little bit of last night's game to calm down from what went on with the Liberty, but that's a whole other it's a whole other discussion, and I'm talking about the, the Aces and Indiana. And Julie Alamond, she is going to be so good in the future. I mean, I feel like she's going to get a couple of votes just because she's put up close to triple double numbers um, more than once. But I mean, maybe she's shooting a bit better than Crystal, but when it comes to Crystal's impact on her team, I mean, if Crystal wasn't playing how she was playing, I don't think the Lynx would be where they are in the playoff race. So it's the danger field. <laughs> I think for me, it's danger fields right now. I think um, just there's been a lot of injuries to the rookie class. There are some rookies that their minutes are not as consistent because maybe they didn't they didn't begin the season danger fields to be uh, as one uh, they didn't begin the season as starters um so i i think i won't add anything there what i will say is i think that there should be more consideration given to satu sabali who is squarely my second pick uh satu has struggled as a rookie um she you know was starting uh, she dealt with injury, but has managed to still find multiple games where she's getting double doubles. A lot of that coming on the the rebounds um, and on the boards, which I love, especially for post players that can play on the block. Sabali can do that. She is also a proficient mid range and uh, perimeter shooter. She passes very very well and I think that Dallas has gone to Satu as a calming effect um, just because Arike is without question their leader they've gotten great minutes from Marina Mabry Um, I mean even Ty Harris has for a while had some really good moments for for Dallas but I think ultimately 
when it comes down to it, just as she was at Oregon, Satu has kind of been that rock and having to learn as she goes. She had really tough defensive matchups with uh, Maisha Hines Allen and uh, with uh, Emma Mieseman when they played Washington and got that overtime win. Um, so I think that it's, it's, it's not a smooth sail for Satu Sabali, but I think all things considered her path uh, being what it has been the rookie season. I think she deserves some votes, but ultimately I think that Crystal Dangerfield will take it. Go ahead, Natalie. Um, yeah, I think that just kind of going off of what Erica said, I think one issue that doesn't play in Satu's favor is she's on a team with a lot of rookies. Um, and you kind of see that with the Liberty now that um, Sabrina's injured, just a lot of the, there are some rookies that stand out, but when you have so many, um, it's hard for them to, to stand out individually on the team. Um, so I am going with Crystal. I think one thing that really stood out what to me was the fact she doesn't play like a rookie. Um, and I think that's something really indicative of what rookie of the year should be. Um, her stats are pretty much just incredible for somebody who was a second round pick, wasn't expected to get much playing time, and then is playing significant minutes because of injuries and um, other things that have gone into this season. So I think that's really why Crystal Dangerfield is, is going to end up getting Rookie of the Year. But I think um, Julie Alamon's performance last night um, is definitely going to get her a couple more votes than um, she may have gotten before that. Yeah, I'll have to go with uh, this entire panel at this time um, and go for Crystal Dangerfield. Um, and also because with Satu, she was um, a high pick in the draft and people expected her to play well. Nobody was really expecting that much from Crystal Dangerfield. And she comes out and she's like playing really, really, really well. And also, um, to Erica's point that um, Coach Reeve has it like with the rookies, doesn't really start them. And she earned that starting point as a point guard, like their trusted leader, their trusted coach on the floor. Um, like, so I'm going to go with Crystal Dangerfield. Um, but also my original pick was Satu. And I think going moving forward, I think her game will translate really well to the league. But um, I'll have to go with Crystal Dangerfield. And for um, our second to last award, who do you all think should be coach of the year? Um, we we'll start with Natalie, go to Jackie, and then Erica this time, switching up the rotation. So this actually transitions perfectly because I was gonna say Cheryl Reeve of the Minnesota Lynx, um, just because she was put in a really difficult position with injury, early injuries, um, and other different things that led to her team not being the way that she thought it was going to be at the beginning of the season or even before free agency. Um, and then the team is a lot more successful than people thought. People thought it was, they were going to be a bottom four team, not really go anywhere. And then early in the season, the team proved under Cheryl Reeve that they were going to be good. Um, and they're definitely title contenders, maybe not the favorites, but they're definitely going to be contending for a title. Go ahead, Jackie. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna joke around for just a moment. Is that okay? So people are talking about the fact that Derek Fisher deserves to be coach of the year. And I, I just, I have very mixed feelings just because, I mean, he's got so much talent around him, you know, I think. So I was thinking, well, wait a minute, who, what is the uncommon denominator here? Who was brought in? You know, there were, there were some changes made to the Sparks. And I was like, maybe Simone Augustus deserves to be coach of the year. I, again, I'm just joking. Um, but I do think Simone has brought a, a maturity and a veteran presence to that group. Um, it may not show up in the stat sheet, but also I do agree with Natalie. I think 
the saying, you can't count out Cheryl Reeve. I mean, you say it again. She did that last year and she was handed even harder circumstances this year. Um, I think it's not um, a coincidence that potentially the two rookies of the year have come from the Minnesota Lynx. I, I think that has to do with who these players are in conjunction with really great coaching. I think maybe Bill Ambeer will get some votes because of the fact that he did lose Kelsey Plum and Liz Cambage and everyone was sort of like, how is signing Angel McCautry going to work? How is signing Danielle Robinson going to work? Um, it's worked. So looking holistically at it, I do think that Cheryl Reeve had less to work with um, and she completely just superseded all expectations. I mean, I remember reading rankings that had them in 11th. And so that must have pissed Reeve off or really annoyed her really, <laughs> it tends to. But I, I think, I never thought the aces would function, you know, just with, with not a lot of floor spacing. So I give Bill some props as well. Um, for me, I think, all things considered, it's it's probably Cheryl Reeve. Every team has had to deal with injuries. The injuries have been crippling in this wobble season. Um, I think the reason I, I point to Reeve is because um, I, I like that she has – I mean, everyone's talking about Crystal Dangerfield, but she's also um, – been able to trust Bridget Carlton and Damaris Dantas in huge ways this season. And Crystal's game is great, but it's it's not perfect. And those two in particular, with Sylvia Fowles being out, have stepped up. And I don't think that they're starters in this league for any of the 12 teams, let alone for Minnesota in, you know, a season that doesn't have uh, so many injuries. I don't think they're the go-to, I guess I should say. They're they're considered up until this season or have been considered role players. And I think when you look at three role players um, playing huge minutes and really keeping Minnesota in, in the bunch, uh, I have to go with Cheryl. I also won't lie, I really like that she is so committed to having more women coach and more former players coach and that is a priority that she brought in and um you know i i'm itching to to hear from her coaching staff just because i think overall there's so much power in that coaching staff and and i think although we're talking about coach of the year i really like what what cheryl reeves coaching staff brings to the table i have to give an honorable mention though to james wade and his his staff for drawing up that amazing out of bounds play that everyone was going crazy over it was against the las vegas aces uh you know stephanie dolson absolutely stunning asia wilson with a screen it's a beautiful thing to see uh, and then also I'll give a shout out to uh, Kurt Miller. And I think that's because of consistency. The Connecticut Sun before Kurt Miller were really struggling to find any consistency. And they are, I think, again, the, you know, the team that is, has made its way to the playoffs um, for the last, I guess, going on three or four seasons now. They're, they're the one team that's been in that playoff hunt for those, the, the last four years. And, and that's because of Kurt. I think those are all great picks, um, and especially the shout outs, but I'm going to have to go with Cheryl Weave as well. Um, and not only because uh, her team, most definitely an underdog, um, coming out, and I believe they're seated at number four right now. Um, right, and so, but also, um, I don't know if any of you were at the press conference um, in the pregame on August 26th. But she was so fired up and she was so, uh, so adamant about the social justice issues. Um, but also I have to agree with Erica about the all women coaching staff is like, 
really awesome as well. So I'm going to have to go with Sarah Weave. Um, and our last award, who do you all think should be most improved player? I know this award has a lot of conversation, and so I'm very curious to get your picks. Um, we can start with Erica, then go to Jackie, and then Natalie. Well, up until a few weeks ago, I think this was really pretty straightforward for me. Um, although I think maybe I was confusing it a little bit with six, six player, six woman, I guess, but I really liked what Bria Hartley brought to Phoenix. And I, I personally don't think that it's, it's most improved. I think to the outsiders looking in, she's probably most improved. I think she was utilized in a way that didn't always allow her to max out at her potential. And I think she's found that spot with Phoenix. Unfortunately, she went down with an injury. So that said, um, I'm, I'm taking uh, what, what Chris of Atlanta is putting out there, Chris, GM and president, uh, and I'm going to go with Benajah Laney. Uh, thinking about a player that was cut from a, a team, the Indiana Fever roster, that's obviously a team that's been struggling and able to make the most of her time with Atlanta to the point that she is the Beyonce to Courtney Williams, Michelle. So that's saying something right there because we all know Courtney's got a big personality. And if Courtney Williams is willing to step aside and not be the Beyonce, then I'm gonna I'm take that as, as some indication. But uh, jokes aside, <laughs> Benajah I think is, is my pick overall. Am I next or is it Natalie? Go ahead, Jackie. Oh. Okay. Um, so I was very much so on the Laney train as well. I just loved her story. I loved listening to Nikki Collin talk about her and just this whole idea of, I saw her making shots in practice and I was like, she's going to be taking shots for us. It was just a very like natural evolution. Um, and I also just like how Nikki Collin is open to to things like that um but i have um based on what we saw last night and based on some writing going on at the next i have taken a look at myisha hines allen who has had she's had some ebbs and flows i mean she started out really strong and then she had a bit of a, a lull when the team had a lull but now I think she has really stepped up her game and is willing the Mystics to a potential playoff run, um, sort of neck and neck with Dallas. Um, what impresses me about Myesha Hines Allen is just looking at the numbers jump. I looked at her career stats and it was just, I mean, in multiple statistics, in the rebounds, in the the field goal percentage and the points. Yeah, um, People... I, I may jump in. I was actually, that was my point. Um, uh -huh. she, last year, she was averaging 2.3 points per game, and now she's averaging 15.9. Like, that is a really big jump. Um, so, yeah, but continue, Jackie. Yeah, I mean – I just think people expected Emma Mieseman to be the one who was going to will the team, who was going to become the go-to, but it's been Maisha. You watch her play, and she she is the heart and soul of the Mystics. Um, I also just love her as a human being. I know that really shouldn't be a factor in this, but um, I especially if the Mystics find a way to make it to the playoffs, which who knows? I mean, Arike has been so, so hot, so that might not happen. But if the Mystics get there, I even think that makes Maisha's case even stronger. So I, too, am going to say Maisha Hines-Allen. Um, I was originally planned on making a case for Brianna Jones, who has really stepped up in the absence of John Quell Jones and Alyssa Thomas multiple times this season has raved about Brie um, having played with her for a season to Maryland um, and then playing with her overseas. She was like, she is good. She's going to be good. Um, 
but a lot of people still weren't expecting it, despite literally being told by Alyssa Thomas that Bree Jones was going to be good for the Sun. But then I was talking with Jen um, during the process of her making the chart that is in her story um, on why Myesha Hines Allen should be most improved player. And I looked at the numbers and I was like, wow. Um, I, though I cover the sun, um, I do go to school in Mystics territory. So I was able to see the last few regular season games for the Mystics. And she was only out there like a couple minutes. She wasn't really doing much. So just from going from that, um, it was kind of a similar role to Bree Jones or even Bree Jones would play more minutes, not necessarily score anymore, but then to see the jump that she's made. So my honorable mention does go to Bree Jones, um, but I think Myesha Hines Allen is going to get it. Just even if I, just if that, that chart is submitted uh, with somebody's ballot of just like, here's why. And the, the numbers are really jarring. Um, I think the, her biggest jump was in points per game, but she also went up 80 rankings in um, rebounds per game from 83rd to third. So that just those big jumps, I think are really what's gonna set it over the edge for her. Um, I'll have to agree with Jackie and Natalie for this one with Maisha Hyde's Allen. Um, I know the point I shared before, but the big, uh, like Natalie was saying, the big jumps, um, in rebound and in points, but also, um, and like Jackie said, this shouldn't be a factor, but just the personality. I don't know if any of you saw uh, her interviews of Leilani Mitchell and Emma Mieseman, um, but <laughs> those just say a lot about her as a person and that carries to the court. Um, and, but also just the big jumps. I think I'm gonna have to go with Maisha Hines Allen for this one. Um, and maybe that one of the biggest questions in this panel, who do you all think should win the 2020 WNBA championship and why? Um, we can start with Natalie, then go to Erica, then go to Jackie. Um, unless something weird happens, Seattle Storm, they're, they're just gonna win their second championship in three years. Um, I think very rarely have they looked vulnerable and I think in a five game series, um, because they're going to secure one of the, I think they're securing one of the top two seeds, but as long as they do that and don't end up in a single elimination game, I don't think they've looked vulnerable consistently enough this season for them to really fall in a five game series. Um, so I think Brianna Stewart is going to do what Brianna Stewart does and everyone around them. Um, that team is, I think, one of the deepest in the league. And they, they started out as one of the deepest. They didn't really start out with any injuries. Um, like the Sun started out with um, people people injured. They started out, um, Free January was still in COVID protocol, but like the Seattle Storm started out with 12 people, which this season, wild concept. Um, and then they're also just so deep. Um, they can put anyone out on the floor and just they have so much team chemistry because most of the team is the same from the last couple of years. Um, and then their rookie, uh, Ezzy uh, Magnagor, it's just, she's, I, I don't think she's been consistent enough to have gotten consideration for rookie of the year, but I think that she can really make an impact um, when she's on the floor and given that opportunity. And again, I think Part of the reason she hasn't been as consistent is because she hasn't gotten as many opportunities um, because the Storm, again, are, are one of the deepest teams in the league and had those 12 players to start. So she wasn't really called upon in a way like Crystal Dangerfield was. Yeah, I think it's Seattle's, um, it's probably Seattle's year. Uh, I think the injuries point in, and the depth of the team is extremely important. I also think that we see that veteran leadership matters a lot in the WNBA. Um, and I, I just don't know that it gets much better as far as veteran leadership than, than Sue Bird. And when Stewie is essentially playing like a veteran, that, that certainly helps. Um, I think that Las Vegas 
is probably the team that if it's not Seattle, that would be where if I were a betting woman, that's where I would place my money. I'm not. Um, but I think that the what's a little bit different for Las Vegas is that they do struggle with some inconsistencies. And while Asia Wilson is having a great MVP season, we do know that she's been battling injury. And so it's just a matter of if she stays healthy and if she stays sharp, um, because again, uh, the aces are going to go the way Asia goes. Um, so uh, if Asia, if Asia's going to put the aces on, on her back, then watch out everybody. Um, but I still think that, it would it would be an upset uh, if it's not Seattle. I agree. Um, when the storm are on, they are scary. Um, it is it is very scary. Even looking at their bench, I mean, some of those players would be starters on other teams. And it also just goes back to the fact that they've been together. That core has been together for a long time. And they just, they look so comfortable with each other. I think with the Aces, an issue, in addition to what Erica was saying regarding um, health and, and to be honest, although the Aces have played really well, I remember in the beginning of the season, you know, not everyone was there. It took Sugar Rogers a while to get there. I mean, it was just, there were a lot of moving pieces and it didn't seem like they had enough players. I don't really think they even play their bench. Um, they just have those, or, or, there are a couple players that just sort of sit there. I, I'm not sure. I'm sorry if I'm offending Aces fans. Um, Cause I know they, they picked someone up and then they dropped her off. I think that was Megan Huff and, so I don't know if the Aces have enough depth to make it through that entire journey. If Asia Wilson just does the unthinkable um, and just wills them, I mean, that would be some series. But I also think it could be quite possible that the Sparks, um, I don't know how the, the bracketing is going to go, but what we saw from that game, the Sparks in Seattle, where Jewel Lloyd, you know, makes that buzzer beating three. I mean, that was a great matchup. I would love to see a series with those two teams because their identities are really similar. So it's sort of going to be like, okay, who, who is the most consistent? I think it's Seattle. Um, but I mean, I think a, a finals or a semifinals series between those two teams would be excellent excellent basketball it would be such a gift and also it was quite special to see Jewel Lloyd hit that three after she was in well should I say insulted I don't even know what I should call that but I mean we shouldn't disrespect Jewel Lloyd she's she's a great shooter I mean I feel like she doesn't even get as much attention as the Sue Bird and the the Stewie and and the Natasha Howard. I mean, Jewel Lloyd is just sort of there and she does her job and she's pretty pretty good at it. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to go with the Seattle Storm uh, along with agreeing to all of your points. Um, but I mean, they also have they also have the experience of being in a championship and. and that situation. Um, of course, with, as I know all of you mentioned, they have most of their returning players from what, uh, from last season and two seasons ago and two seasons ago, they won the championship. So like they are, they have that experience and, and they know what it's like to be in a championship situation and the aces don't as much. Um, so I think it'd be a first for most of the people, um, in that group. Um, but I, the Storm have that experience. Um, and they also have somebody who, they also have like a starting five that, I mean, is just amazing. Like the starting five of uh, Brianna Stewart and Natasha Howard and AC, Alicia Clark and Jewel Lloyd and Sue Bird. And like, who's gonna, who, ha who has the same amount of star power to stop all of those people? Cause all of them are threats. So I'd have to go with the storm. Um, and I also realized I forgot six women of the year. So I'll take those picks as well. Yeah, sorry for, um, 
I didn't give an order. Uh, we can start with Erica, then go to Jackie and Natalie. Uh, yeah, so I kind of alluded to this a little bit. Um, I don't, I just don't know if my position changes, even though uh, Hartley went down with an injury. I just think that no one was really expecting, foolishly, I don't think enough people were expecting her to be great, and um, she really was. So I think I'm just going to stick with that just because I also like to be low-key petty, and, you know, I know some people had some thoughts about Bria Hartley when she was on New York, and I always thought that the, the, some of those uh, critiques were a little bit misguided. Uh, I think New York has challenges, but Bria Hartley definitely wasn't one for me. <laughs> well, I was one of those Bria Hartley haters. I apologize, and I apologize to Bria. I mean, she just, she functions really well in Sandy Brundello's system, and I just think the way in which the Mercury organization, um, you know, have cared for her and her son. I think it's just, it's such a good fit for her. So as a human being, I'm very happy for Bria Hartley, very happy for her. And let me just say, Bryson, that child is just a breath of fresh air. Um, and his his little relationship, who, who or his little friendship, is that with Amaya? I think it might've been. Speaking of, um, I think my pick is going to have to go with Dierica Hamby just because her numbers have gotten even better. Um, I mean, I'm thinking about the whole thing I said before with, okay, if you take Asia Wilson out of the equation, what happens to the aces? I think someone who would take a lot of that load would be Dierica Hamby. Um, she, she always just has given them that spark when they've looked dull they they turn to her and when she steps on the court the course of the game changes i mean i picked up the numbers here i mean she was scoring 11 points a game in 2019 and now this is up to 13.2 um her rebounds uh, oh no those have gone down but the points have gone up um and i think that's significant uh, her minutes interestingly enough have gone up and her field goal percentage has gone up from 48.8 to 55.7. So that is my pick to Erica Hamby. Yeah, I'm gonna echo Jackie. Um, I think this season has kind of been interesting because a lot of what we would normally consider contenders for sixth woman of the year are starting this season because of all of the starters that are out with either injuries or other um, things like John Quell Jones opting out. I know a lot of other players opted out. Um, but the fact that De'Ara Kahambi still comes off the bench confuses me, but it works for them. It's worked for them in the past. I, I, I can't really explain it. Um, so just really want to echo all of Jackie's points. Um, but I also want to give a, a shout out to the Connecticut Suns two rookies. Um, both of them started out the season um, kind of slow, Beatrice, Mom Premier, and Kyla Charles. Um, but Beatrice, a couple games ago, the days all kind of blend together with games every other day, but she had 16 rebounds, which was the most by a Connecticut Sun player coming off the bench. Um, so really, especially as the, the Sun built their core, that was their core four for um, several years. Um, they Rookies had a, a hard time trying to find playing time, but this season, Kurt Miller has had to play his, his rookies. Um, and I think Kyla Charles, who tried to develop a three-point shot in college, has developed it now. Um, and it kind of surprised a lot of people. It surprised me um, after talking to her after draft time, but she can hit threes. She doesn't necessarily hit a lot of them, but she will hit maybe one every once in a while. Um, and then mom premier struggled to get playing time early on. And then she exploded with that 16 rebound game and had good moments, um, especially as the season went on and players got more and more banged up. Um, and then back to Kyla for a second. Um, Delana Bonner hates when Charles guards her in practice, hates it, um, and has said so um, 
in post game, like, no, Kyla, don't. Um, so I think that's just really indicative of what kind of defender she is and what kind of player she can be in the future. Um, so I don't expect them to get this award, but I wanted to give them a special shout out, um, especially how they've developed throughout the season. Um, I can't imagine be, uh, having this situation as a rookie year to kind of, this is your introduction to the WNBA playing every other day. Um, Kurt Miller has mentioned a couple times, like rookies don't have a lot of time to get better because they're not really practicing um, because of the games every other day. So just wanted to give those two a little bit of a shout out. Yeah, and um, although Dierka Handy is a great six woman coming off the bench, I believe she won last year, um, and I feel like people weren't expecting Bria Hartley to play at this level. Um, so I'd have to go with Bria for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I love Erica's reaction to that, but um, yeah, I'd have to go with her for that because nobody was expecting that. Um, similar to my pick of Cheryl Reeve for Coach of the Year, because nobody was expecting the Lynx to play as well as they are, and nobody was really expecting Rio Hartley to play as well as she was, sadly, after she got she got hurt. But um, yeah, I'm gonna have to go with um, uh, Rio Hartley, uh, although Dierka Hamby, I I assume will get a lot of picks. Okay, um, so. I have two questions left, um, taking a step away from awards. What are your main takeaways from this season, social justice and basketball? Um, I'll start with Jackie, go to Natalie, and then Erica. Oh man, that, that's a loaded question. Um, it's weird because if the season, it, it was shorter than a typical season, but it just felt like so much happened. Um, I think when we talk about social justice, I'm going to always come back to this idea of acknowledging how hard this work is. And I think that's something I sort of knew, but then by covering um, these players, I started really learning why it's hard and how it's hard. Um, just learning about how their first step was really to get educated. You know, they knew they cared, but they were like, well, we need to make sure that we know these stories, we know the facts, and we have the tools so that we can go and continue to do the work. I think that sets an example for all of us in, as we're on our own journeys of, you know, trying to fight racial injustice, it's, we've got to take those steps to do the work. And sometimes it's not going to be, you know, very flashy. Sometimes it's going to be taking 20 minutes out of your day and spending some time reading about history or going on the internet and, um, finding out about different um, policy organizations and saying, oh, maybe I'm going to donate to this one or subscribe to their email newsletter. Um, I became really educated by just um, the African American Policy Forum. I mean, I, I sort of knew what they did, but I mean, the fact that Kimberly or Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw was a main figure during this season um, I really dove into some of her lectures and some YouTube videos of her speaking and learned what she was all about and the movement that she helped create. Um, so to me, it was really part of doing the work is learning and, and diving in and doing your research and then sharing that with other people. And I think that's something that the the players have done so beautifully and i understand that it's 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 very hard to see um you know saying oh we're gonna strike here we go we're just not gonna show up and you know that can be that can that can make an impact and that can look a certain way um but we don't necessarily hear a really fascinating story behind that day when you were at your computer and you learned something new, um, you know. So I think that's what I take away. 
most social justice wise is just a, um, it was a, a refocusing for me as to how can I be, um, how can I be better? And I think um, the players of the WNBA, they personally helped me try to figure that out and get there as they're on that journey themselves. Yeah, um, I agree with everything you said, Jackie. And I think somehow th these women have become even more awe-inspiring to me. Um, I didn't realize that was possible, but they're not only playing every other day, but there's so much going on emotionally for them. They're still taking the time to get educated. Um, they've spoken with a lot of victims of police brutality, their family. Um, which I have to expect is emotionally draining for them, but they do that on their off days and then they play the next day. Um, so for them to really compartmentalize aspects of their life, they're an athlete, um, they have to do recovery for that. And then they're also getting educated, making statements um, and all of these things. Um, one of my favorite thing that occurred all season was the Liberty's Black Trans Lives Matter shirt, um, as well as all of the other shirts I've seen throughout the different media availabilities, players in all types of different shirts. But I think that the Liberty choosing to raise awareness of Black trans lives um, is incredibly important because that's um, something that a lot of people weren't necessarily talking about. Um, so seeing those t-shirts is always made me um, kind of happy to see that that was getting spotlighted. Um, and then each team is doing something a little bit different. Um, Jasmine Thomas has spoken before the season and then during the season about how the Sun are really making sure people are registered to vote um, and understand the importance of voting, not, even, not just in our national election. They're also um, really focused on making sure people are voting in their local elections. Um, and understanding why it's important to vote at, at every level. Um, so for me, for the ju social justice takeaways, these women are, are more inspiring than I think we even thought possible um, for just all that they've done. And then a small basketball takeaway, there were a lot of injuries. Um, and this kind of ties back into what I was talking about with social justice was to that they're playing every other day. They're tired, they're banged up. Um, I'm honestly shocked Alyssa Thomas doesn't just live in an ice bath um, because like these players are playing. Um, uh, I think one game Dewana Bonner played all 40 minutes and then played like 36 minutes the next game, um, something wild like that. And they're, they're playing every other day. Um, so just, it doesn't, it didn't surprise me to see so many injuries, but it's tough watching games where either a lot of players aren't playing because they're hurt or they don't look the same because they're hurt or um, just watching so many injuries happen during the game. Um, so neither one of those was um, exceptionally joyful, but, um, oh, my last one, um, I have to get this in there. Um, Baby D, um, Bria Holmes's daughter, um, just, she has brought all of the social media of, about her, like seeing her sitting courtside, her birthday party, um, which Jen and I wrote about um, Mystics and, and Baby D's birthdays. Um, but I think that has brought a lot of joy to um, a lot of people, especially on the sun. Um, I remember there's been like uh, swimming with Auntie AT and um, then Natisha Heideman over the weekend was holding her to her chest as she slept and Wheels on the Bus was playing on the TV. Um, so just the little takeaway of like, there's still joy in the bubble, even with so much going on in their lives. Um, and I, I think according to Bria's Instagram, Baby D is getting her own Instagram account. Um, so there will be more Baby D content. Um, but yeah, that, that's the last takeaway that I wanted to touch on. Yeah, going off a lot of what's already been said, I think the biggest takeaway for me, actually, Pepper, came from an interview that you did with Diamond to Shields. Uh, actually, I think it was your debut for the next. And in that interview, and then you reiterated, and then so I reiterated what you reiterated, um, Diamond says that Black Lives Matter is the bare minimum. 
And I really don't think that that can be overstated. Right now, what we're seeing happen in this country, the United States, and in the world is that, I mean, there's there's almost, you know, um, especially with Naomi Osaka, some of the questions that she's had to field about the masks that she's now wearing during the U.S. Open. I think there's a confusion that Black Lives Matter is some type of trend or um, fashion statement, as has always been the case. Uh, black people, people of color, indigenous people are nothing if not resilient. And we will always find ways for our culture to rise to the top. But don't get it twisted. Saying, wearing Black Lives Matter is the bare minimum. And even believing Black Lives Matter is just the beginning. There's so many things that we have to do in this country. And I think it's been amplified in the sports world to make that not just an aspiration, but something that is true and is true to the core, to the fiber of who we are as people. And so there's a lot of work that has to be done. And to Jackie's point earlier, I think you're seeing that play out. Lasia Clarendon has been a, a huge highlight for me as someone who is an activist and comes from that world of being able to bridge the gap that, again, wearing shirts is just the beginning and there's so much work and literally people's lives They've spent their lifetime, such as a John Lewis, may he rest in peace, working towards this. And I don't think that that can be forgotten. I hope that it's truly not forgotten. Um, and so I think that's really been the highlight for me. Another highlight, though, to go off of Baby D and and respectful, respective and respectful of your age, Pepper. I, I think that, and this is me speaking, I won't put this on you, but I think a lot of people are enamored by your age and just your energy. And I think that's beautiful as they should be. But I think for me, I'm proud to call you a colleague, not because of what you're doing because of your age or despite your age. I'm I'm proud to call you a colleague because of what you bring to the conversation, even looking at the sign that's hung up behind you and, and that you claim your space. And there's so many of us that have had to hold space for others um, and maybe not reap the rewards. And so I'm just hoping. And my big takeaway is that everything that we see these women on the court um, and, and players like Lasia doing for basketball that we can also do for women who cover basketball and women who cover women's basketball. And so uh, that's been a bright spot. You've definitely motivated me. And so I wanted to take some time to say that. Wow, um, just a million thank yous for that. Um, I feel like for all of you, honestly, like, oh my God, Jackie Powell, oh my God, Erica Yao is in this meeting. Like, it's a big deal for me to be able to be on a panel for you, let alone get like a big shout out from you. So that means a lot. Um, but my takeaways, I would have to say are, um, I have three of them, um, actually four of them. I hope I can get this through fast because this has been an amazing but hour long um, panel discussion. Um, so starting with just the effect that the activism of the league has on children and young fans like me. Um, I know I asked a lot of players um, this question about that effect, but what w one of the answers that really stood out to me was Gabby Williams's response. Um, she said that she hopes she knows that when black girls turn on the TV, if they see someone like them, they're portrayed with stereotypes. And so she hopes that the now black girls can turn on the TV and see her and the other black women of the WNBA. Um, and that honestly had me in tears. That answer was amazing. And I hope you all can hear that for yourself. Um, but also August 26th, I know I mentioned this before, um, starting with the Bucks and like ending with the Mystics, and just like the message, like I hope that the, the NBA and WNBAs and all professional uh, sports leagues that day message got out to everybody because that needs to be the message that's close to your heart. It is like 
I mean, I don't have any words for that. Like August 26th. Um, also, the injuries, it has been um, terrible. Like terrible, terrible. Like we are missing out on uh, the first pick in the WNBA draft this year and Sabrina Inescu. Um, but also like Bria Hartley, who was having a standout season. And I mean, it would take another hour long to list all the injuries. It's terrible. Um, and I hope that next season there won't be as many, um, but also just to round it out with another note of activism, just the way that the WNBA always applies unity when standing up for social justice, especially, um, with the picture and image of them all locking arms with everybody except Enrique, who had I Am shirt on, saying, um, <laughs> with shirts that say, arrest the cops who killed Breonna Taylor. Like, that is just a powerful message. Um, and that's what I want to leave our viewers and listeners with. Um, but thank you, thank you, thank you again to Erica for that shout out and to everybody, uh, Jackie, Erica, and Natalie for being on this uh, panel. I really enjoyed talking with you. Um, and I have to say all these picks really made me, um, if it wasn't my pick, it made me think twice about mine, honestly. The reasoning behind all of these, all of your picks were awesome. Um, and everybody's takeaways um, was awesome as well. So um, I just have to thank you all so much for being on this panel. Thank you, Pepper. Always a pleasure also to work alongside Jackie and Natalie, truly. Yeah, oh, so much love going all around. Thank you for having me and thank you, Pepper, for just being who you are. I mean, I've said this, I've tweeted this, your emotional intelligence is just so incredible. It inspires me. I'm inspired by you. I listen to you. I think about the questions you're asking and I think how I can, you know, make my questions better. So, you know, thanks for just, you know, creating a community and being someone willing to create a community and cultivate great relationships. So thank you. Wow, thank you. I mean, no words for all of this, honestly. Um, well, yes, thank you all. Um, and this is what I'm saying to all my friends in the media. Hope to hear slash see you in a media availability soon. Um, but, but seriously, thank you, thank you, thank you for being on this panel. Yeah, um, thank you, Pepper, for, for having me. And it always makes me smile um, when I see your name pop up. But I also know that I need to, to make my questions tougher, kind of the same thing that uh, Debbie Antonelli said. Um, when she interviewed you, uh, which my roommate and I made that must watch television, that halftime game that it was on. Um, because I've, I've shared a lot of stories about covering um, the league, just like I would do if I was actually leaving my house to do so. Um, so it, it's been awesome to, to get to be in media availabilities with you and listen to, to all the podcasts. And I'm, I'm really glad you uh, let me be on the panel today. Well, uh, thank you again for reaching out, first of all, being the first three to reach out to be a part of this panel. Um, but, oh, yes, all these answers are so amazing. And I mean, I can't even believe this right now. Thank you all so much. I really enjoyed being a part of that discussion. I hope you enjoyed the panel, too. Big thank you to Erica Ayala, Jackie Powell, and Natalie Hevron for making that panel as amazing as it was. As always... You can find me on Instagram at Dish with Pepper, and please subscribe to the next to watch amazing panel discussions and podcasts like this one. And please tune into my next episode.